Good morning, good morning. If you don't mind, would you please join us as we sing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Choir's taking the week off today, and so you all sang our, our call to worship in Detroit, and you all sound marvelous. That might be our summertime uh, way of doing worship. Our call to worship is from Psalm 51. This is the New Living. You're familiar with the words in the King James. This is the New Living version of that, and I'll read the light print if you all read the dark print together. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise you. The Lord's faithfulness endures forever. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let us pray together. Holy triune God, who was, who is, who always will be, you've spoken to us through your word made flesh. Now we pray that you would continue to guide us by your Holy Spirit to your truth, that we might glorify you now and forever. Amen. Amen. And as you remain standing, if you will join us as we sing, Come Thou Almighty King. And as you remain standing, let us unite in this historic confession of the Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, Third day he rose from the dead and sitting to heaven and sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. 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 And before 
before taking your seats, if you reach, you reach across the aisle, take a few steps and greet two or three people, somebody you haven't spoken to yet. Today. I'm so oh, glad when the music stops. The music stops, everybody finds their seat. I sent Jordan a few Good pictures morning. earlier today. I know it becomes a thing. All right. <laughs> There's nothing like good conversation and good Christian discipleship. All right. Um, the news of the day. I guess the favorite is number one, which is the picnic at the lake, which is uh, set for next Sunday, the 19th. Uh, the gates will open. We'll be at the St. John's United Methodist Church uh, rec area up at the lake. Most of you know where it is, and if if you want to drive, you're welcome to drive. If you want to ride on the church bus, please let us know so we'll know how many. And if not, it'll be everybody's on their own. See you there. There's a food sign-up list going around. Put your name on the, on the list to bring something yummy for you to me. You know, all of them desires you want that you say you're going to make, that you're not supposed to eat, that you're going to take to somebody else. Now's the time to do it. So you can sneak and put one on your plate and not feel guilty. All right. Um, and by the way, the bus, if you decide to leave from the church, the bus will be leaving at 4 o'clock. Um, old McDonald's Fish Camp, United Methodist Men, or Ladies' Nights Out, as we would call it. The Ladies' Nights Out will be June the 23rd. We need a head count um, as soon as possible. The sooner the better. You can... Uh, let us know or uh, get in touch with Carl so we can make reservations and they'll know how many to attend. Uh, we'll meet there at 6.30, but if you're riding the bus from here, we'll be leaving here at 5.30. The Breakfast Club at Ruth's, 8 o'clock on Tuesday morning. Man, there's something else I'm missing. And I can't think of what it is. Not yet. He's always good, don't get me wrong. But that part is not here yet. I sent Jordan a couple pictures. I can talk about those for a minute while you think about what you forgot. Okay. okay. That'll work. You ready? There we go. They asked, uh, some of y'all asked me where Lori is, my sweet wife. She's uh, up in Minnesota. Uh, that's her mother in the center. I met her in Minnesota, by the way. My two brothers and sister and her brother and sister all went to the same high school. And uh, her sister's on her right. On her right. And the brother's uh, the tall one there. And his, her brother's wife is over there. So she's enjoying two weeks up north. She said the high yesterday was about 75 degrees. But I said, well, I hope the mosquitoes get you. Uh, <laughs> 
go to the next slide. We had a uh, birthday party yesterday for Miss Margaret. A hundred, uh, she turned a hundred last Thursday. I left uh, the happy birthday on our sign out front. Someone said, how come we don't do all the birthdays out there on the sign? I said, when you turn a hundred, we'll put, we'll put your, your name out there too. Go to the, there we are. Get a little bit of a distortion there. Uh, Margaret definitely looked better than that picture, but, uh, <coughs> but it was a lovely gathering. I appreciate uh, uh, our being able to make the Family Life Center available and a lot of church members there supporting her and a lot of family members. They did a nice, nice job with this uh, gathering for Ms. Margaret. And that's it for me. I figured out what it was. You said what it was. Okay. And that was the birthday party. So the typo in the paper in your bulletin this morning that's saying that her birthday is June, uh, June the 18th, that is a typo. Yes. That was the thing that I was going to bring up. So now are we ready? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Gee, let's try this again. Hello. Good morning. Now are we ready? Yes. God is good. All the time. And all the time. Say it like you mean it. Say it like you mean it. And if you will just remain seated and revert back to your childhood days as we go back and sing, Jesus loves me. looking around looks like all y'all know the words to that one we we're all singing on uh, I, I put that in there just as a reminder that kids matter and that uh, that part of our job is letting children know not just that Jesus loves us but Jesus loves them too we have a little clip here on parenting and this is just a reminder of the opportunity we have especially in summertime I see we got AJ back here uh, good to have you here with us this, this morning. It's a, just a good reminder that during summertime, things are sometimes different. We have kids with us, or grandkids, and nieces and nephews that were around, and there's opportunities uh, to share our faith. Are we ready with that clip? Okay. A holy stewardship, a precious opportunity, a divine calling. A parent. Parenting isn't just about babysitting and potty training. It's not just about teaching them to ride a bike or tie a shoe. It isn't just about making lunches and brushing teeth. Parenting is about changing the world. It's about reminding our kids who they really are. Children of God, born for His glory. So parents, let's remember, that the most important meetings of your day aren't in a conference room or on a stage, but at the dinner table and at the bedside. Let's remember that there's no quality time without quantity time. That the most valuable thing is not what you leave for them, but what you leave in them. That every time they fall down, you have the responsibility and the privilege of lifting them back up. Remember, 
that your kids don't need you to be popular, productive, and certainly not perfect. They need you to be present. And remember that every time you wipe away the tear on their cheek, you're giving them a glimpse of the day when God himself will wipe away every tear forever. The Bible tells us to train up a child in the way they should go, and even when they're old, they will not depart from it. So show them the way. Pray for their soul and give them your best because God gave you to them. our heads and pray together. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for summer times and how things are different in the summer season. We're thankful, Lord, for more opportunities. Lord, help us to, to make the most of this quality time, of this time that we have. Help us to share our love and our faith and our hope in you. Lord, we know indeed that you love us. The Bible tells us and we know in our hearts that you love us. Help us to find ways to pass on that faith in you and knowledge of you and love of you to the next generation. Heavenly Father, we continue to pray for the world around us. We pray for our nation and the nations of the world that you would give peace that you would raise up peacemakers. We pray for your people, for Christians here in this country and on other shores, that we might worship you in freedom, that we might glorify you and serve you in ways that please you, and that all of us who are your people might be unified, we might be one. We pray especially for our community here at Burns. We're thankful for Miss Margaret's 100th birthday, and we rejoice with, with her family. We ask that you add to her years, and we pray, Lord, that whatever her secret is, that you might help us all to uh, leave happy and, and vigorous lives uh, for many years. We ask, dear Lord, that you would be with the Edict family and Miss Catherine's passing. We pray that as they gather on Friday for the funeral and as her son comes down from Ohio to be here, we pray safe journeys for him. We're thankful for her life and for her love and, and for all the good that's come out of her life. And we just ask that, that it might be a time of rejoicing in who she is this coming Friday. We pray, Lord, lastly, that here at Burns, especially, that you might help us to grow in our love of you, loving you with heart and mind and soul and strength and indeed and truly loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. And be with us, Lord, and shape us into a community that pleases you in all that we do. We pray this in your name, and together we pray as you taught us to pray, by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. off and, and brother Bill Williams is going to share with us a solo at this time. 
the singing in the garden. I think he wants to share a word or two about the song before he sings about it. You know, uh, when the pastor and Carl and I was walking in the gym the other day and he asked me to but I do a solo and I said, well, and I said, yes, no problem. But I want to share a little bit about you about this song. It was written by Charles Austin Miles and it was done in 1912. And he said he was inspired by scripture and the scripture was John 20, 14. And this is when Mary Magdalene had met with Jesus right after his resurrection. And uh, he said that's why this song inspired him so much. So I would like to share it with you at this time. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses and a voice I hear falling on my ear the Son of God discloses and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own And the joy we share as we tarry there None other has ever known He speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gives to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own oh and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known I'd stay in the garden with him though the night around me is falling but he bids me go through a voice of war to me his voice is calling and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy the joy we share as we tear none other has ever known. Amen. Amen. Beautiful, Bill. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Bill's a retired sergeant major. Of all the sergeant majors I met, he's the best singing one I've ever seen. <laughs> Our scripture today is from 
The Gospel of John, chapter 17, reading from the New Living Translation. The text actually is printed in the program today. You would stand, please, for the reading of God's Word. Jesus here is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And you notice in the opening sentence that he's praying not just for these, but in a way he's praying for you and I as well. John writes, And I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. <clears throat> For about a thousand years, the church has recognized the Sunday after Pentecost as Trinity Sunday. Started with an English bishop named... Uh, well, I remember his name after the sermon, probably. <laughs> but uh, we've been remembering the Trinity. <clears throat> and I wanted to have a disclaimer as we start to talk about it. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. You look through the Bible as hard as you want, you're not going to find the word Trinity in it. Uh, and so... I think we, when we meditate on the nature of God, I think it's worth remembering that we're, we're, we're trying to understand the nature of one who is far beyond us. It's a little bit audacious, Trinity Sunday, for us to try to explain God. I read one time that the highest you can go on an IQ scale is 160, and that Albert Einstein is said to have had 160 IQ. Here he is with some children. In 1936, this is another picture of Einstein with his son, uh, Hans, and grandson, Bernard. Do you think Albert Einstein could have explained the theory of relativity to his little grandson, Bernard? It'd be kind of hard. How would, how would Bernard respond, even if he, uh, how would he, how would he share what his grandfather had tried to explain to him? I mean, he might try a simple analogy to explain how objects affect other objects. I read one time that, that this is one analogy, that if you look at a trampoline with nothing on it, the surface is flat. If you put a bowling ball out on the trampoline, that will go down, it will settle in the center and the trampoline will sink a little bit. And then if you put a golf ball on it, it will roll to the center. And so the, the effect of the bowling ball is to have an effect on other objects around it, to pull them toward it. Uh, but I don't know if, if Einstein could use that or anything else that would make sense to little Bernard there. He looks like he's about three. I mention that to say that when we talk about the nature of God, it's, it's, we, we need to have a little bit of humility about it. How much can we really understand? We're going to understand less about God probably than Bernard knew about his grandfather. Uh, but the reason we can understand some things is because the Bible is all about God revealing himself to us. And God reveals his nature. And as Jesus prays in the garden uh, of Gethsemane for his disciples, as he prays for them, there's a connection between the nature of God, the unity of God, and what Jesus is hoping for, for you and I, for our nature, for our unity. Remember in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, Moses is on the top of Mount Sinai, and God sends him to Egypt to ask to command the Pharaoh to let his people go. Remember Moses' question to God. He says, whom shall I say has sent me to Egypt? And the Lord says, say that 
the I am has sent you. The I am, Yahweh in Hebrew, the I am. And it has a sense of uh, I am the one who is, the one who has been, the one who always will be, and, and maybe a little bit of a sense that you're never going to really understand exactly who I am. So I imagine Moses goes to Egypt and he tells the Israelites, our God has called us out. It's time to, time to get ready to leave. And they say, who? And Moses says, his name is I am. And that's all I know. He's the one. He's our God and he's calling us. And maybe, maybe the church should stop there and just, just accept that God is beyond us. He is the one who is. But if we were trying to explain the nature of God, we might talk about some of the things that God is described as doing in the Bible. For instance, Genesis 1, verse 1, and the Lord said, let there be light. Our God is a creating God, a God who creates things. Or you might talk about other things about what God does, that God is good, as we say in our affirmation, that God is love, that God is just, that God is like the father of the prodigal, welcoming us home. This is what God is like, but, but who is God? Well, you might say that God is like all the omnis, I'm not talking about the Civic Center in Atlanta, but the, the omnipresent, that he's everywhere, the omnipotent, that he's all-powerful, the omniscient, that God is all-knowing. Well, what else would you say about the Lord? Eventually, you come to this word Trinity. And it's not in the Bible, as I mentioned, but it's an ancient church word. It comes from a man named Tertullian who lived in Tunis, uh, or as Tertullian would have known it as Carthage in North Africa. Tertullian was a church leader and a writer. I think he's the first to write about faith as being a matter of the heart, that, 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 that we need a conversion in our hearts as we follow Jesus. And so he's writing in 210, writing in Latin, and so when he writes about the Trinity, it's Trinitus. And his understanding of the Bible was that God was three persons and one substance. Or in Latin, tres persona una substantia. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One God and three persons. Three persons distinct, yet one in substance, one in nature. There are a lot of analogies that have tried to illustrate this through the years. Sometimes you hear the water illustration that water, you, you experience it in three forms. You can have the liquid water or the solid and ice or the vapor, the, the steam of, of, uh, of, ice, of, of water vapor. Ice is not liquid water, or liquid water is not steam, but in essence, they're all H2O, right? They're all, they're all the same at the core. Sometimes you hear a variation of this, the Shakespeare illustration that William Shakespeare was a playwright. Sometimes he would direct the plays he wrote, and sometimes if he didn't have enough actors, he would also act in the play he wrote. Three different roles, but the one Shakespeare. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, that they are one. And the Holy Spirit is sometimes called the Spirit of God, sometimes called the Spirit of Christ, and most often called the Holy Spirit. They are one. And certainly there's this unity about God. I, I, I think the best analogy I heard to explain this was the family analogy. Imagine a family named Smith and, and they run a farm together. There's Mr. John Smith and Mrs. Jane Smith and they have a son, John Smith Jr. They're united by love, united by work, united by mission. They're all Smiths, but each is a distinct person. Each has their own tasks, their own particular work there at the farm but they're all part of that one family. Father and Son and Holy Spirit, three. And the Father isn't the Son and the Son isn't the Spirit, but they're all God and all God together. Amen. I know it, it seems like a contradiction. Muslims and Jews will claim that Christians aren't truly monotheists. They'll say that we are polytheists. They'll say we believe in three gods. But Christians are not polytheists, at least not in the, in the way the ancient world thought about polytheism. Let me tell you a story. I know you've heard it before. Uh, it comes out of the Odyssey, a Greek story written by Homer about 800 BC. There's a story in which the Greek goddesses are jealous as to which one is the most beautiful, whether it's Athena or, uh, or Helena or Aphrodite. 
And so they want Zeus to say which one's the most beautiful. Zeus, being somewhat wise, doesn't want any part of that. So he picks on an earthling named Paris, a Trojan prince. And all three goddesses appear to Paris, and they all offer different things. Athena offers to make him a great general. Helena offers to make him the richest and wisest ruler of the most powerful kingdom. Aphrodite offers him the most beautiful woman in the world, Helen of Sparta. Well, you know the story. He picks the girl, and the war follows that. Friends, this is what ancient polytheism is about. The gods, by the way, take different sides in the war, some of them helping the, the uh, Greeks, some of them helping the, the, uh, the Trojans. This is what ancient polytheism is all about. God's jealous of each other. God's at odds with each other. God's working against each other. God's at war with each other. That's what classic polytheism is all about. As opposed to this, the Christian trinity is a belief in a united God. God united in love. God united in purpose. God united in goal. God united in, in work. God is one. So Jesus could say in the Garden of Eden, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, I would that this cup would pass from me, but not your will, not my will, your will be done. You see the different wills, Jesus' will and the Father's will, and Jesus, Jesus wanting the Father's will to be done. I know it's a hard concept. I think that's why it comes, uh, comes up throughout the Bible, not just in the New Testament. I think it's hinted at even in the Old Testament. You know, in the first chapter of Genesis, verse 1, you read that God created the heavens and the earth. The word for God there is Elohim. It's plural. Literally, it's God's. And the word create is singular. So literally, it's God's did one thing. God's worked together to create, the, the worked as one, creating the world. The Jewish scholars will say this is the royal we, and like the queen might say, we are not amused. Uh, but it may simply be a hint of the Trinity in the very first verse of the Bible. Down in verse 26, you have uh, Genesis, the writer comes back to this concept. And God said, let us, plural, make humanity, plural, in our image, plural. So God created humanity in his image. And in the image of God, he created them, male and female. One God, yet a plural one, and to make God's image, you had to have more than one, more than one that are meant to be linked together. In the second chapter of Genesis, you read, therefore man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife and they become one flesh. Once again, two persons, husband and wife, yet in one sense, in a sense, one. One flesh, one married unit, one united in love and purpose working together. Jesus refers to this, by the way, in the New Testament when he's asked about divorce. He says, have you not read that the one who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And he said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not no one separate. Two individuals yet united as one. One in commitment, one in value, one in love, one bound in heart and soul. This, this plural one. I think that's what's meant by the word trinity. This, this three persons, but one God. You say, John, what difference does it make to us? Well, here's the thing. Jesus in the prayer wants us to have that kind of unity. The late Bible translator Eugene Peterson had a neat way of describing the Trinity. He, he, he refers to a word that the 4th century monks used to describe the triune God. They used the word perichoresis, meaning around, and, and chorotic, which, means, which is the word choreography comes from. And it means dancing around as if they're in a square dance or in a group dance. And so Eugene Peterson, the scholar, says one way to visualize the Trinity is to picture this divine uh, dance, this divine unity of a God moving in sync, in unity and love, in step with each other, working together. Their fellowship has been from everlasting and will be for everlasting, three as one. And then Peterson asked that great question. He says, can you hear the music? 
Can you join the dance? Can you get in step with God? Can his ways become our ways? I know there's a lot of uh, uh, retired military and those who served four years and got out military here. You all heard that, that command in boot camp, get in step. It means put your left foot down when everybody else's left foot is, is hitting the, the ground. Get in step. Can you get in step with God? Jesus' prayer in the Gethsemane is that kind of prayer. I'm praying not only for these disciples, he says, but all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will be one just as you and I are one. Speaking to his disciples there in Gethsemane, but also speaking to us here today that we would be one as God is one. It doesn't mean that we're not separate individuals, not unique and not not different in a lot of different ways, but we're meant to be united in what's important. United in core values, united in working together in hearts and souls, trying to share our faith in the Lord and to serve the community in the name of the Lord. In the book of Acts, you read over and over that there are miracles happening in the early church, and you also hear this phrase repeated over and over that they are of one accord. One accord. Not a car they drove. It's speaking about, about their unity, that they are united in spirit. Seven, seven times in the book of Acts, they're described as being of one accord. The church was in power. The church grew in spirit and love and numbers. But at the root of this was their, their unity as a community. Jesus prayed that we might be one as God is one. As God is one. Friends, I think we are, in a large sense, united as a community. And I pray that this summer as we move forward and this fall as we look for no, new ways and, and continue old ways to serve God in our community, that we will continue to work together to share our faith and our love with each other and with the world around us. Let's bow our heads and, and pray together. Heavenly Father, we are in... We stand in mystery of the trinity of, of your nature, of who you are. But we know that at the core of who you are, that you are, you are united as Father, Son, and Spirit. And that somehow your unity is a reflection of, of what we are all meant to be, united in one Spirit, working together. We pray, Heavenly Father, that if there be any self-will, any resistance, any own wayness, any sense that we would rather be isolated than working together. We pray that you would take this away from us and help us, Lord, to find our strength and our nature and our identity in our community together. Bless us, we pray in your holy name. And all the people said, amen. Amen. And if you will please stand as we sing our closing hymn, they'll know we are Christians by our love. the father
I had to smile when we sang the part about walking hand in hand. Last week, I helped chaperone the children's roller skating. By the way, I stopped and I helped her up. And uh, she said, just hang on my hand and I'll show you how to do this. <laughs> and so we went around hand in hand for a while. Just a reminder, next Sunday, in addition to the Sunday morning service, we're going to have a picnic at the lake. Yes, yes, I know that's Father's Day. Burles and I talked about it, and it seemed like a good way to spend Father's Day. So uh, in addition to worship that morning, we're going to have a picnic at the St. John's property and then a worship service uh, at the lake after that. Mike's going to be there with his keyboard, and, and we'll have a little part where you could call out hymns, and, and uh, uh, we'll sing together and have a devotion. And, Come early. There's a nice beach there. You can jump in the water if you want to. There's actually a dock nearby if you, want, if you have a boat and you want to come by sea. Um, and once again, the Breakfast Club this uh, Tuesday, 8 a.m. at Ruth's. Jim and I are always there, but the table's big enough for at least two more, so we can, we can have more if y'all want to meet us. Here now the words of the benediction. Go forth in peace. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.